This is the story how we raised a year's worth of free-range pastured chicken with very little effort at our own homestead over a three-month period. Our journey to chicken self-sufficiency began with meeting local pasture-raised chicken farmers Jeff Powell and Michelle McManus and their entourage of Maremma Guardian dogs at Southampton Homestead. They run chickens commercially in self-contained chicken tractors, moving them daily onto new pasture. This method means the chickens get fresh green pick to eat daily, minimises the manure load in any one place on the property and offers just the right amount of disturbance to increase biodiversity and fertility in the pasture and soil. The result is delicious ethically raised chicken that has in turn assisted in regenerating their land. Impressed by the operation at Southampton Homestead, when Jeff mentioned that there were going to be some day old Ross chicks available, at a reasonable price, we decided to purchase 50 of our own to raise and process on our farm. <laughs> uh, so at very short notice, we've made this uh, brooder. So it's just uh, one of the IBCs that I've cut down, um, lined it with some black HDPE, and then I made this very, very simple frame um, out of pallets and some scrap pine, and then our neighbour was kind enough to give us some of this Avery mesh. We do have a 150 watt heat lamp um, and I just bent up a little bit of wire here in a, in a Z just so we can locate that wherever we want. We've got a little chick water here um, and we'll probably hang this from here um, once they get used to it so stop, stop them getting all the dust and everything else like that. We've made some temporary feeders out of egg cartons. We'll upgrade that to easy, easy to clean PVC later on. Um, again that was inspired by Jeff and Michelle and their ingenuity out at Southampton Homestead. So, but just for the moment, we're advised just to make it easy for the, the chicks to feed. I shouldn't have worried too much. I got some Jarrah sawdust. Again, the neighbor came through. He said he knew where there was a big pile of sawdust for the, for the taking. So we went out there, we got Jarrah. So that's a, um, a native hardwood and it's this lovely red color. And chick feed really stands out nicely against it. So we haven't had too much of a problem getting the chicks to actually uh, take their food. So we've followed local advice and we've put game bird starter along with the chick starter crumble. And what that means is they've got um, additional protein to start with. That's important. Uh, if the chicks don't get enough protein, they actually start pecking at each other and go down the cannibal route, which we don't want. So it's all, um, it's all looking fairly promising. It was at short notice, um, but we're pretty excited. This is, not yet, but this is a year's worth of chicken. Hey guys, how are you? Let's <laughs> have a look at you. So this is eight or nine days later. Uh, I think we got them last Thursday and it's Saturday today. Look at these things. So these Ross birds have been um, bred to have really good food conversion, put on weight really quickly and I believe it. So they're absolutely crazy for food and as soon as they've gotten used to me feeding them now so look at that, they're just crowding around my hand wondering where the food is. Um, at the moment we've taken the food trays out. I'll just, I'll just go grab a food tray and I'll show you what we're using. Yeah, they, they look big now. I mean they're only like little tiny things before. They barely filled the brooder and now they're filling it. How much longer do they have in the brooder do you think? Oh, like 10 more days. Yeah, 10 more days. I mean, it should be th three weeks, but they might be a bit big at three weeks old. Might have to pull them out at two and a half. This is what we've been using to feed them. So we just got the idea off um, Jeff at Southampton Homestead, where I just split open some PVC pipe, put some slits in, and that's just a bit of fencing wire with some bends in it. So it's easily removable, but most importantly, there's, it's nice and smooth, and there's no way that chicks can get caught in it. So this sawdust has been very absorbent. It's worked out really, really well, um, especially as a free resource. So the first week is always the time when, as we've been told, um, you know, we're not expert at this, but the first week is always the danger period with these young chicks. That's when they're their most vulnerable. I guess the same with babies. Um, so we're really happy we've had zero losses.
Anyway, look out. They need to get out of the way. They don't have an instinct for that. Oh. This one's in there. I'll get the second three to go on. They're, go they're just going through that ugly phase where they're starting to lose some of their fluff and they're getting their proper Ross white feathers. All right, it's absolute chaos here, as you can see. It's time to get them out of the brooder because they're, uh, you know, we have to keep just throwing heaps of sawdust in to keep them nice and clean. We're going to get them out of here. We're going to carry them over into the uh, over into the field, and we've got a mobile chicken house waiting for them. So I made the door removable because in the future we'll probably want to use this as a pig shelter. So because we've made this with fairly straight bits of timber um, and the land here is quite undulating because we, we haven't gone to the trouble of flattening it like um, Jeff Howe did out at, out at his um, chicken farm. It is quite undulating but I have run some barbed wire here. Um, that's not so much for the chickens. They're, they're kind of a little bit big to try and get that gap. But if we have a fox start to try and stick his snout under as an exploration, there's a little bit of wire there. And of course now Jet is on the job. So we can see that the way I've made this, once the chickens are pretty much finished with it, we'll be able to take the door off and pigs will be able to come in and out of here and shelter um, through the wet season. We've got a number of shelters going on, but we're expecting to have lots of little pigs. And that's why I made it this way. Um, our friend Jeff, he makes his more of a Salatin style chicken tractor. And that's you know, a rectangular box. Um, only yay high and he moves that quite easily. We went for this um, a bit more elaborate design just so it's more multifunctional. Maybe it'll be goats in here, maybe it'll be piglets. Re really not sure. So we, we just made this general purpose and that's why we went with this design. Someone is very was, fat. Was trying to make a jailbreak. They'd seen, <laughs> they'd seen the procedure. <laughs> what are you doing in there? Hmm? <laughs> Come on. This is a ferment that we've made for the chicks and it's just a recipe from a local chicken farmer. So we've put in poultry mix, which is a mix of grains and seeds and, um, and peas as well. And then we've also put some barley in, um, some seaweed, some molasses and just soaked it in water overnight and it's kind of sprouted and gone fermented. Um, they don't love it yet, but it's really, really good for them and they do eat it eventually. But they do prefer like their crumble that they were having when they're little chicks, but this is much better for them and so we're hoping that they get into it as they get bigger. We do like it. It's just not a frenzy like when you get them crumbled. Once the chickens had had a week to get used to their new home, we decided to let them out in the afternoons to free range on the property. Fortunately, in the evening, they returned to sleep in the enclosure so we could shut the door on them and keep them safe. So these chickens usually when they're raised for meat they're raised in very tight confined spaces but we're hoping that by letting them out like this they'll have better muscle tone, they'll be happier okay, through their, through their life until it is dinner time. Um, and also normally if we had them confined we would be just, they would only be getting the food that we gave them which I mean there's a bit of variety in it but not a ton of it. 
So this way they can find nice tasty grasshoppers, bugs, everything. So they'll have a lot more diversity. And there's just a bit of green pick starting to show up, a few green plants, and they can get into that. So it's really great. What a racket. That's the local Carnaby's cockatoos that have just shown up. So there's a type of eucalypt here called the Mary and they really like eating the big gum nuts. They, they chew into them and get the little seeds out of them. So they seem to migrate around this area and about every month we get about 100 to 200 cockatoos show up on our property. And it's always a really special event. It's a noisy event, but it's a special event. At eight weeks old, we were impressed to discover that most of our chickens were weighing in around one and a half kilos live weight. Our aim was to get them another kilo heavier over the following five weeks. So, in addition to their fermented ration, food scraps, waste grain from the local brewery, and free-range foraging, we started giving them more pelleted food, especially designed to help them grow fast. In the meantime, we were kept busy in the garden, harvesting the last of our summer crops, so we could plant and prepare the beds for winter. As the daylight hours decreased and the weather began to get colder, we were dreaming of enjoying our own pasture-raised chicken soup by the fire. So our neighbours very kindly dropped us off some uh, some potatoes. He's been getting waste potatoes that haven't quite made the grade and he's been boiling them up. We gave him, well, he bought uh, a couple of our piglets off us and he's been spoiling them rotten to be frank. <laughs> um, but he's boiled up some potatoes, he's dropped them around. I'm going to swap him some apples and I'm about to go get some of them. So they're for our pigs, but we've also been fattening up our chickens with them. So they've been getting uh, some waste grain from the local brewery, which they absolutely love. And we've been fermenting their normal feed with that. But we're also going to go squash a few of these potatoes for them. And we'll see what they think of it. When the chickens are hungry like this, we have to be particularly careful not to step on them. They aren't too smart, and getting out of our way is definitely not their priority when they're competing for food. Well, that was pretty straightforward. So yes, how, it was. How long has it been? It's been three months since we uh, these little chicks arrived here at the Ramshackle Ranch. So three months ago they looked like this, and now <laughs> they're these um, these hungry, hungry things that you see behind us. So as we've raised them each time, we've made sure that um, you know they follow us around for food, and it's made getting them in their final transport much, much easier. So hopefully the rest of the day goes just as smoothly as that. <laughs> you say their final transport, they're just going 200 metres that way <laughs> to the shed. So we're going to be processing them here on the farm. Yeah, that's right. Mm. I'm just throwing in some of these wood shavings. It's not it's not sawdust. It's um, shavings out of a, a industrial planer. Just throwing that in there, just so they don't have their feet on the cold steel. And they're going to do a few poos, even though we've been we withholding food. So <laughs> this might absorb it pretty well. So we don't really have an ideal setup because this isn't a regular part of our lives. <laughs> so it's a bit improvised. Some traffic cones here um, and you'll see what they're used for. They just restrain the chicken. There's some buckets here so the chicken's head's going to come out there. We're bleeding them out. We want to save the blood so we can do that. Keeps the mess down as well. Um, it is a little bit messy. Some plastic on a frame here. And then 
In an ideal world, I would be able to put them straight in a scolder and then straight in a plucker. But we don't have that, just the shape of our land. I don't want to have water pooling. Um, so we've had to move things a bit further down this way. This old drum's been with us for quite a few um, kilos of meat now. So we're going to be using this for scalding the chickens. I wanted a big body of water just so it keeps its temperature. And the temperature we're aiming for is 65 degrees. Give or take, um, you know, two or three degrees. So, and when I say 65, I'm talking in Celsius, aren't I? So um, I've got the thermometer stuck in there. It's just telling me how it goes. That 65 degrees is super, super important. Um, it releases the, the proteins that are hanging onto the feathers. If you go too high, it sets and you're really hard to, to pluck those birds. If it's too low, they won't release, but you can always like bring the temperature up later. If you make it too high, you're done. This is the, where our workflow is a little bit um, stuffed up that I have to come over here, but the, I want the water to drain off, but the, the feathers to accumulate on the concrete where we can just shovel it up. So this is a chicken plucker if you've never seen them before. You turn it on and there's a little rotating thing there. It's a bit of a chicken disco in there. So we have Jeff Powell, um, who we've gone and visited a few times now at Southampton Homestead. He very kindly lent us this, <laughs> saving us heaps of time um, and a ton of money actually, to be frank about it. This can handle two to three birds. We're gonna just do two birds at a time to make sure um, it's a good pluck. So that this turns like a five minute job into a 10 second job. Cause that's normally, plucking the chicken is normally the bottleneck. Then from here, we're going to the processing table. That's where um, Pascal and our neighbor, they're gonna be working their magic off with the head, separate the neck um, and then the rest of the bird. And then we've got some chili buns, some eskies, just on the other side, full of ice for the carcasses. Hopefully it's going to work good. After the birds had bled out, we scalded them for 45 seconds in the 65 degree water. It helps to agitate them with a stick to make sure the water is getting around all of their feathers. Using a pressure cleaner like this was incredibly handy in assisting with the feather removal and making sure they exited the plucker. And just like that, our first two chickens were ready to be eviscerated and prepped for chilling in the ice boxes. Well, it doesn't look like your normal supermarket bird, does it, with its little feet there? But um, <laughs> that didn't take very long at all. So we did um, 40 birds plus another um, another five. So 45, nearly 50 birds. We did it in about two hours. So I have to say that the um, the, the plucking machine is the, the thing that made that possible. Though. It made a really big difference. So if you are thinking about doing a lot of um, a lot of chicken raising and you're going to be doing a lot of chicken eating, well, you're going to need to do a lot of chicken plucking. So a chicken plucking machine is a definitely a good thing to try and beg, borrow or steal. So now we've got the clean up here, obviously, but we'll clean up these carcasses and we'll put them in vac seal packaging. And the reason that we're going for vac seal is because it really helps avoid any freezer burn. This is some really good quality product and we want to look after it. We were grateful that we could load the chickens in their ice bath onto a pallet and take them up to the house with our tractor to finish the cleaning and vacuum sealing process ready for freezing. So I've got a nice setup here in the laundry just to process, I put all the offal in here, so the liver, the hearts, some of the skin is all sitting in here in some ice, so it's time to dry it off and vac seal it all up into bags and also clean it up because I just didn't have time to clean it up and not good light and everything um, outside there in the shed. Nice 500 gram pack of liver.
With the offal done, we removed the feet off the birds so they could fit into our vacuum bags. Our style of vacuum packer made it quite difficult to vacuum seal the birds quickly, making it the most time consuming part of the whole process. At the end of it all, we were excited to weigh in some of the larger processed birds and to discover, to our amazement, that they were two and a half kilos. Well, there we go, Pasky. Would we do it again? I think we'd do it again, yes. Okay. Do you do it again? Yes. Um, so some of the things that we've learned, why don't we just cover that? So mm -hmm. free ranging those chickens, they were incredibly dumb and we found out one of our pigs got a taste for chicken. Yeah. <laughs> so, so one of them got in the way when she was feeding and she one lashed of the chickens out in got in the, in the pig's way. In the pig's way, when the pig was feeding, she lashed out in anger and then discovered that the chicken was full of delicious chicken. So. Yeah. Now that might seem obvious, but those pigs had been raised with chickens around them and they'd never had an incident. Yeah. But these chooks, um, they would dive in right under their snout. Yeah. Um, and then once the pig figured out that they were delicious, the way these are meat birds, they're not very fast. And our pig actually worked out a way of being able to stalk them. She became <laughs> quite predatory. <laughs> so she actually ate, um, eight. Eight, eight of our chooks. Uh, I was responsible for crushing two right at the early stages. So our chicken house that we made, I, was, I mentioned in the video that we, I, I wanted to make it dual purpose. Later on, I wanted pigs to be able to use it. That resulted in it being quite heavy. And in the video, you saw that um, Pascal and I, uh, it took both of us to move it. We actually got better at moving it, um, but you know, it was awkward. So I would make a lighter one in the future. Yeah, one more, a bit like Jeff's style. Yeah, I think I would actually use one inch tubular steel. Okay. Um, it wouldn't seem that steel is lighter than wood, but because it's so much smaller, yep. um, you could do it. Yep. We're also weighing up um, breeding meat rabbits. So if there's anyone out there in our comment section, thank you for everyone that gives us really great, helpful comments. But if anyone's had any experience with rabbits, hit us up in the comments and we'd love to see that. Um, that is something that we'd like to try a little bit further down the road, but we still need to do a bit of research. Um, cost, what Total do you think? cost. So each little chick was $2.50 Australian. So that's not US dollars. It's, um, you it's have to. Aussie pesos. Yeah, Aussie pesos. <laughs> um, and I think we figured out that it cost roughly $10 per bird on top of that. that, to that that's factoring in those losses to the pig, That right? is factoring those losses to the pig. So maybe if we hadn't lost those 10 birds, it might've been more like $8 to feed each bird. Um, having said that, we were feeding them some of our own food scraps and also a lot of free brewery grain. So. Yeah, mm. yeah. You'll have to excuse the guinea fowl in the back. They're, <laughs> they're lobbying to go into the freezer next. And um, one of our favourite beautiful black hens. So that does that might sound a little bit expensive when you can just um, saunter on down to the shops and get like a fifteen dollar roast chook out of the window, but. We know what went into those chickens and um, at two and a half kilos average each, they came out at a lot of really, really good food. Yeah. Oh, you're bloody. Oh, Get out of there, you are rotten. Oh, oh, oh. Um, what else, Pasky? Um, I think we have to have a big shout out to Jeff Power and Michelle McManus at Southampton Homestead for putting us on this journey. Mm. for raising the chickens and lending us that chicken plucker. The chicken plucker was the really, that's, if you're going to do it, a chicken plucking machine is absolutely fantastic. And as usual, we just want to thank uh, our patrons and the new patrons that have joined in. Um, you know, th th there's been a few people that have uh, pledged like that $1, $2, I think we've even got a $5 a week um, patron. I know it doesn't sound like much to people out there but um when when it all adds, adds up, up it really does help us so thank you for everyone that's signed on thank you for the super thanks i noticed people are popping in yeah. an extra two bucks or something thanks during the video. for people that sent us stuff uh, on paypal when we announced the news about the little one arriving at the end of august that yep. was really lovely that's really great yeah well i think that we've sort of covered everything if you like the video a thumbs up and also we have noticed we've got new people from word of mouth so yeah share the video and uh, yeah, subscribe if you, if haven't. you haven't. See you next week. See ya.